This episode of The Candid Frame is brought to you by the Chico Review Photo Book Retreat, founded by the creator of the Charcoal Book Club. This annual retreat held in Prey, Montana in March provides photographers and editors a unique opportunity to network and hear from some of the industry's top photographers and publishers. Find out more by visiting ChicoReview.com. Valerie Jardin has been a longtime friend of the show. I've had the pleasure of knowing her outside the podcast sphere, and I've taught a workshop with her and shared a lovely lunch with her in a Paris cafe one year. Friendships like this are one of the gifts I've received since beginning this podcast 18 years ago. So I welcome the opportunity to catch up with my friend, who continues to share her photographic knowledge and love of photography with countless photographers throughout the world. This is Ibarian X, and welcome back to The Candid Frame. Well, welcome back, Valerie. It's always a pleasure to sit down and have a chance to to talk with you. Thank you for having me back. It's been a long time, and it's always so nice to uh, to see you, even though it's virtually. But eventually, we'll meet again on the streets of Paris or elsewhere, right? Yeah, keeping my fingers crossed. Though I won't be there for the <laughs> Olympics, that's for sure. I won't either. <laughs> I really don't know anybody who will, for that matter. Everybody living there will be. We'll make sure they're far away yeah. as well. <laughs> when my wife's cousin uh, is one of the people who puts together the uh, the Olympics. She's involved. Wow. She, yeah. So Cynthia was very excited. I said, oh, we'll be able to get some access. And I said, have fun. Because <laughs> Paris is already crazy enough getting around. <laughs> And during the Olympics, it's going to be insane. Yep, I, I'm not. Uh, I'm not even teaching there this spring. It's it's already too too crazy. I'm. I'm uh, my next workshop there is in October, and I've always had a workshop in May or June, but not this year. <laughs> I wouldn't want. I wouldn't even want to be near there, unless yeah, exactly. Unless you had special access, but um, even then, I don't know. <laughs> I like I like minimalist. Well, the last time we were there, and we just had no idea when we timed it, it was both Fashion Week and rugby. <laughs> yes, actually, I was there during the rugby, uh, the final game. And guess what? On my workshop, I had one participant from South Africa and one from New Zealand. And those wow. were the two, two, ga- two countries at the final. So it was... It was very exciting, actually. <laughs> but yeah, the, it, it's crazy. Although Paris is big enough that I think you can, you can, uh, you can still get lost and and find little pockets that are untouched. And I was just having that conversation. How I think like Rome is almost impossible. It's so overrun by tourists mm-hmm. that it's really hard to find little pockets of neighborhood where you won't find a tourist. But I think in Paris, I think because of its size, you can still you can still find the authenticity even at the busiest time. But uh, but yes, when you have big events like that, it's difficult. You know, I've been writing a, a, a lot about process. Um, sitting down and writing down in journals, trying to sort of get a better grasp of it, uh, of my own personal process in terms mm-hmm. of what's, what I'm thinking. And, you know, I think that first started when I first got asked to start teaching, right? Because I never really had to think about what I was doing until I had to sort of communicate that to someone else. Now you've been doing these workshops for, you know, for years well, now. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> you're exploring th- new facets of your photography right now. But I... I'm curious to sort of talk about how that has sort of helped you sort of understand how and why you're doing things and how you feel that that's changed you in terms of uh, photography. Well, yeah, I think you, first of all, you never stop learning. You never, and and that would be the, the, the saddest part if you actually stop learning new things and, and you constantly, um, evolve and change and, and get better. Um, I, I'm more excited today than I was five, six, ten years ago. And, um, and I think, um, teaching, I, th- well, you learn a lot by teaching anyways. And, uh, also to the, the, 
you, it's so gratifying to see your your students um, evolve in their craft and and master different new techniques. Because I see a lot of, I have a lot of repeat customers, so I see them uh, evolve, and that's really really fun to see how they grow from the first workshop they ever did till you know five years later uh how how they've grown uh and then for me it's uh i've changed the way i i photograph um quite a bit i think because i'm on workshop and i don't have much time for my own photography mm -hmm. i have to be quicker if i see a moment i grab it so i don't i don't do the fishing as much as I used to, you know, where you'd find a good yeah. spot and just wait. I make my students do it because I think, you know, they need to be able to to capture, uh, to to be discerning and and wait for the right moment, the right subject, and the right uh, right time. But I don't really have the time. I don't have that luxury of time as much as people might think I have. And so for me, it's more about capturing that moment just the grab sh mastering the art of the grab shot <laughs> right. and uh, which i do when i'm on family vacation because when i'm on family vacation i don't take time for my photography i just have my camera with me but i really just grab moments and so it's made my street photography i think stronger because i think it's it's also yeah, it's capturing the 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 decisive moment, um, and the faster you are at seeing and reacting, the the better the the, the photograph is are going to be. And uh, but it's for me, it's more a personal thing. I'm just I have so much joy of capturing that moment that if I wait in a spot for for too long, I don't have that much uh, satisfaction for some reason. So it's really uh, about setting more limitations for myself. And I really do think that limitations are are good in, yeah. in so many ways. And I've already said that, uh, but setting, setting more and more limitations for myself and uh, making it more and more challenging. And so, so then it never stops being fun. And I set the same limitations when I work on my personal projects. And, uh, I, I don't change anything. I, anything in the way I work, whether I'm, I'm on the street capturing just candid moments of everyday life or I'm working on a project, whether it's, the one century project, which we will talk about, or even my summer vibe series where they're just snapshots of everyday life. But mm. I, I set the bar pretty high for myself. And, uh, but I, I feel so much more relaxed. I don't have the pressure. I don't have the pressure anymore. And I think that's so important because I, I think a lot of us put a lot of pressure <laughs> on ourselves. Yeah. And if you let go of that, wow, I think not only are you more relaxed, and I try to to convey that to my students because a lot of them are putting a lot of pressure on themselves to really um, capture uh, great photographs every day. And that's just not realistic. And so I said, just let go and, and just do things for you and just let go of that pressure and you'll be so much happier. It took me a while, but now that I that I finally got there, I'm just so much happier with my work. Well, that's I really, don't care what people think. <laughs> that's really interesting that you say that putting on the limitation uh, allows you to relax. I think when people hear that, they think it's antithetical. It 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 might be, but the the limitations are to challenge myself because I won't be happy if it's too easy. Uh, but then the satisfaction of capturing the moment within those limitations while not really having to try that that I have. That makes me really happy. Yeah, I I find that um, the simpler I work, the happier I am. Exactly. You know, I I cannot work with two cameras. I can't work <laughs> with a bag with two or three lenses. I mean, it's nope. just it just adds a bunch of noise to it. So mm -hmm. I just kind of live with one camera with one lens, whether it's a thirty-five or a fifty or twenty-eight, and I'm good with that. And yeah, and I've been shooting this with the same camera for ten years, and uh, I I really don't need anything else. I'm perfectly happy with that same focal length all that time. So, 
<laughs> well, you become real adept when you're using one focal length at, at seeing the world, even when you don't bring the camera to your eye. Absolutely, yeah. You kind of, you know exactly what it's going to look like before you actually raise the camera up to make the picture, which is why I'm yeah. a big advocate about working with one focal length for, um, for a while. Mm-hmm. But when you're taking on a, a project, let's talk about the, you know, the, the Century Project. Um, it's, it's largely environmental portraiture. As you said, you're, you're taking the same skill set of what you do on the street and, and doing this kind of work. How does that, for you, how does that translate? How does the things that you've learned as a street photographer help you when you're creating more intimate photographs where you're engaging with someone as opposed to street photography when you're usually not? Oh, um, um, it helps a lot because, well, you, you know, exactly, uh, again, I'm using the same camera, the same focal length. So I, I'm, I'm much faster and those projects, I have to work fast. I never ha- spent much more than 30 minutes with one centenarian. Uh, and so, and nothing is ever staged. I move myself. If they want to rearrange things, I say, no, 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 don't. I, I'm going to. I'm going to work around the problem. And so to me, that's part of the limitations. And, and I love working that way. I love, um, it's like a puzzle. <laughs> so you have to find solutions and, and moving yourself around the, the subject, whatever they're doing, uh, whether they're sewing or playing cards and, and making sure, you know, the, there are no distractions in the background without removing anything or moving them to a different place. I, n- I never do that. So I approach this, which is, yes, environmental portraits of people in their environment. Um, and th- the same way I do street photography, it's completely uh, untouched, uh, except, of course, it's not candid since they know they're being photographed. But I make sure they don't they don't do anything. Sometimes they'll want to pose with a, a picture of themselves, you know, when they were young and things like that. So I'll do that portrait mostly for them. But uh, what I love is really capturing them after they forget. They forget I'm there. We- I still talk to them. The whole process is, you know, we interact. They love, they love talking. They love, they, they love telling you the stories about World War II or, you know, their life at the farm or whatever. I mean, these are all people that are 100 to 108 so far, uh, that I've photographed in the past few months. And so they love to, to tell their story. So it's really interacting, never bringing the camera to my eye. So they see my face the whole time and uh, interacting and then moving around. I keep my camera full silent. So they very quickly forget I'm taking pictures and they resume just whatever they were doing, whether it's reading the paper or doing crossword puzzles. And, uh, and then I get the true, their true personality. Takes a little while. Sometime you have to work around. The relatives, often there will be a son or a daughter or granddaughter, uh, present. Uh, but, um, I usually find a way to, <laughs> you know, say so maybe you could go for a walk and we'll be fine. Cause I, it's just like working with children. You know, they'll be <laughs> more themselves if they're by themselves and not having someone to just watch everything they do and, and try to do things for them. They, they they're in, they're still very independent and, and they can do everything on their own. They don't need help. And so it's really, uh, it's all about the respect and, uh, and then letting them be themselves. So, uh, in a very, very short time. So with street photography, because you don't have that luxury of time and you have to position yourself, okay, uh, that's going to be distracting, sticking out of their head. So I'm going to move myself really quickly. It's the same here. I, I really, it's a dance basically yeah. around the situation and the same dance we do on the streets. And, and, and that's why I love, uh, those types of project because it keeps me, uh, uh, it, it, it makes me happy because there's so much joy in, in those photographs. And I learn so much and it warms my heart every time I hear their story and I can share those photographs with the family. But, um, it's also keeps me sharp on the street. So those are the, the, the project that I think are so important to do. Um, even as a street photographer, everything everything else I do will keep me um, keep my skills up. Let's uh, let's give people an overview of the project. 
Mm-hmm. And how, how, what was the spark of the idea? Um, I've always wanted to do a project about um, elderly people. And I had thought about 90 and up. <laughs> it would have been easier, right? <laughs> I said, no, nope, I'm going to do 100 and up. And, uh, and, but it, I didn't want it to be about their, their history. I want it to be about them now what they do now, what what makes them happy. And I didn't really know what I was getting into until I photographed my first, my first centenarian, 102, who swims for an hour every afternoon. And, um, and that's when I really defined the project as portraits of centenarians and the activities that bring them joy. And so it's not always easy because one of them, uh, Gordon, um, his favorite activity is talking with his friend. It's not something you can convey in a still photograph very easily. So, you know, trying to find ways to convey conversation. So, you know, hand gestures. And um, he was very animated when he was talking. He loves talking about his, he actually, um, um, on D-Day, 80 years ago, he was at Omaha Beach. And so he he gets really animated when he talks about uh, those days. And so, but his friend did not want to be in the, in the photograph. So trying to convey that sense of interaction by just photographing over the shoulder of his friend who is out of focus in the foreground and then uh and then the centenarian who is having a conversation and you can see the spark in his eye so really working around the, the I never know where I'm going to be I really know what their hobby is going to be sometime I ask I ask the uh usually I communicate with a, a son or daughter and I ask, I say, what, what are their favorite activities? Uh, sometimes they say, oh, I don't know. Uh, or, uh, why well, he reads the paper every day or, uh, they play bingo once a week. So then I try to coordinate, say, okay, if she plays bingo every week, what time, what day? I need to be there at that time. And, and then, uh, to capture that activity. So it's really about the, the activities. And then, and then you hear their stories and, and, uh, and again, I'm not there to write a whole chapter about their lives. Mm-hmm. Um, I capture a few, a few sentences. I usually take notes at, right after I leave them. I write the few notes of what they, they told me about. So it's just about capturing, um, the moment and then a few words about their life. Um, and it, it doesn't, I mean, I just drove eight hours this week just to meet this um, 102 year old Lois Widmark, whose favorite hobby is driving. <laughs> and um, that was just amazing. Yeah. Remote part of Minnesota. Um, and her daughter was there. And so the daughter was trying to kind of plan things. I'm like, no, 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 no. I don't want her to be holding this or doing that. Just let her do what she does. And she wanted to show me her list of activity was like a mile long. I'm like, okay, well, we're not going to be able to do all this. So, but I could tell that she wanted to drive her car and show me how well she can drive. And so, uh, the daughter didn't seem too keen on that. Uh, and then I said, you know, I just drove four hours just to get here. <laughs> I'm going to head <laughs> right back home after this. So let her drive her car. <laughs> and so she got in her car and then she just lit up and she was so happy to show me how well she can still drive at 102. And so that was the, that was the shot is, is the, the pictures of her, um, pulling her car out of the garage and, and she's so proud. And so happy. So um, it's uh, it's it's interesting. Um, again, sometimes it's it's harder to get to their true personality because of whoever will be there yeah. in the room with them. Mm-hmm. But um, after a little while, they relax and they really and I and I really engage them. I say, "Oh, tell me a little bit more about this, and tell me a bit more about your cat and things like that." And then they really. Um, and I, I'm really good at uh, <laughs> conveying the message to the other people that you know maybe it's just about them right now, yeah. and uh, they love they love it. They love to be in the spotlight. Unfortunately, I've had a few um, uh, family members 
um, telling me, oh, no, I don't think it's a good idea to have my mom photographed and without, I'm pretty sure, without even asking. And I find that to be uh, a little sad because I've, every time I've met and I've photographed 16 in just the, the past few months, every time it's been just the highlight of their of their day or their week. They're so happy to to have that ex that new friend and that yeah. interaction with somebody new and then to be to be in the spotlight a little bit. So um without any spotlights. I don't use any lights. It's really I I I do everything in window light and uh low light sometimes a little too low, but uh <laughs> make it work. It's not about the it's not about the technical um um uh, it, I, I don't care if it's noisy or, or whatever. It's really about the moment. And so, yeah. You know, you mentioned that, that from, from the conception of the project, the idea was photographing uh, people doing things that they love to do and that they enjoy doing. But uh, but as when you start working on a project, it sort of evolves and changes on its own, mm -hmm. becoming whatever it needs to be. I know you're still very early on, on the project, but what have you noticed Have you that you've learned that you hadn't anticipated when you first came up with the idea? Well, the, when, when I started, I did not know it was going to be about their favorite activity. And the first centenarian, actually, they're not, the pictures are not even on the, on, on the, in the gallery. They're portraits of the centenarian sitting by the window and then portrait of her, you know, with a picture of herself when she was five years old or whatever. And I thought that's just going to get boring really, really quick because I need, I need something. I need an edge. And then that, that woman told me, oh, and I swim every afternoon. And then boom, light bulb. Mm. <laughs> I'm like, you swim every afternoon? Can I come back tomorrow? And so, um, and I felt kind of bad because she had just had her hair done and everything <laughs> to, to, to see me. And then uh, I wanted to photograph her in the water. Uh, but uh, so I came back and then I knew, I knew it had to be about their activity. And, and yes, it evolves. And then you try not to do to repeat yourself because it'd be, it, it's just like in the street photography. It's hard. It, it, it'd be easy to repeat, you know, a, a same recipe. And I try not to, uh, even when they do similar activities because a lot of them still do, uh, uh, quilting and things like that. So you try not to, to repeat or I will try some different techniques in framing or, uh, creative focusing. One comes to mind. I'm, I'm, I have several World War II veterans in the series. Some of them are actually traveling to Normandy next month for the 80th anniversary. A mm. hundred and seven year old is traveling to Normandy to be at Omaha Beach on, on June 6th next month for the 80th anniversary. So incredible people, incredible stories. And so, and they all want to show me, you know, their medals and things like that. So trying to, to photograph that in different ways so that I don't have pictures in the gallery that look the same, the same, same type of metal and photograph the same way, or they like to show me their, um, their picture from World War II. They usually have their picture in the uniform. And so one time I remember I, I had the focus on the picture and then the centenarian is out of focus in the background. So that was a different way of of showing them, um, so that it, it's, uh, it's more for me too, because I, I like to be challenged and I like to, to try different techniques just like I would on the street. So, um, and then it's really their personality that will dictate how things go. Sometime they're really, I've, I've had one who was just a really, really sad person. And it was hard because I really had to get things out of her. It's like, Hey, what do you like to do? And um, and you could tell she was just done. She she didn't. She, it, her attitude was completely different from all the others. And mm. and it, I left feeling really really sad. I'm like, how oh, can you be so healthy at 102 and not wanting to to live anymore? And I, so the, then you you listen to them and you you. You talk with them and and try to uh, find some positives and and uh, because you you know you you hear of so many people who you know 
don't have that chance. Um, but then they also have some sad stories because a lot of them have buried their children. So you, you, you listen to those stories and you think, wow, yeah, you don't think of that. Yeah. Um, but uh, a lot of them have. And, uh, but then the, the ones that are so, so positive and it's all, they have this amazing attitude. Two of them, uh, particularly uh, Lois and Reynolds, uh, and I think those two should meet, although they, they live about eight hours apart. But they're <laughs> like, like peas in a pod. They have such a positive attitude. They're so happy uh, to wake up in the morning. One gets up at five every morning and he's in his own house. He does his own shopping, his own cleaning. He cooks for himself and drives his car every day at 7 a.m. to meet his friends at the coffee shop. And like... How amazing is that? So, uh, so you try to convey that spark in the photograph, and and um, so it's it's always different. I never really know, never know what to expect. And and again, I just drove eight hours, um, six of which were in the pouring rain, uh, to to see this this amazing woman, and I really did not know what to expect, yeah. except that she was still quite active. <laughs> that was quite a quite a trip for one one photo shoot. It's it's a fascinating project because it allows you to see life from a perspective that very few of us get to. You mm -hmm. know, you get th the breadth of all the experiences: love, loss, grief, yeah. joy. You know, all of the, all of those accumulative uh, moments are in that person's through that are embodied by that person, and you yeah. get to sit there and sort of engage with them and. I, I can't help but imagine that it probably gives you a very uh, interesting perspective on your own life. Oh, absolutely. It really makes you think. I mean, s some of those people are, <laughs> you know, uh, literally 50 years older than me. And I'm thinking, you know, there they are. They're still driving the car and meeting their friends for coffee every morning and and embracing life and traveling. It's incredible. And, um, and then you kind of want to know their secrets, right? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so I always ask, I always said, what's the secret? Or, um, uh, one, one, uh, Reynolds, who is 107, who is actually going to Normandy, uh, next month with a group of, uh, World War II veterans for the 80th. Uh, anniversary. His his thing is every time he says goodbye to someone, he says, "Have a good day," unless you have other plans. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I, I usually have a quote. I, I have every picture in the gallery has a quote, and then um, their name, their age, and then a few few words, and then where they live. And um, that man is is so positive and so full of life and joy. Uh, he had his hip replaced when he was 103 you know, oh and he God. still lives at home. <laughs> and uh, so you leave and you, you're you so full. It, it just warms your heart, really. And, and I get attached to a lot of them. And so I want to see them again. Uh, so the ones that are not too far, I definitely uh, visit them. I visited uh, some of them a couple times already, and they love they love to see me again. Sometimes you see a little decline uh, the second time you visit them, which mm -hmm. kind of makes you sad. Uh, because how can they be so full of life one moment and then just a month later they already yeah. decline? But it goes really fast too at that age. So. Um, yeah, it's it's fine. Um, actually, my son had the the, the opportunity to meet uh, Reynolds. We were in Wisconsin, and he came with me. And uh, I was so happy that he got a chance to to talk with them. And he didn't want he didn't want us to leave. Actually, <laughs> he just we could have stayed there all day. And uh, I mean, how how many times are you going to meet someone who is 107? And Reynolds actually said to my son, "You know, I've been drinking coffee since I was 105." <laughs> <laughs> so no, since I went, no, I've been drinking coffee for 105 years. years. He started drinking coffee when he was two years old. And so, uh, so I've been drinking coffee for 105 years of my life. My God. And, and then your eyes just, you know, get, it's crazy. Yeah. You, it, they always have those little stories. So sometimes it's not about the big things. It's little things that they want to share. It's, it's, it's great. Yeah. I can't help but, uh, to think that, um, you know, the fact that you love and enjoy photography so much, 
that that provides a way of being able to connect with them, even though they're not practicing photography, but that Mm -hmm. the experience, the joy of discovery of awe that comes with it, that's something that you share with them. Yeah, it's... It touches their life in a way, and I know that the the, the families are always so happy to get those photographs because they don't have those photographs. They they never would have had those photographs. Right. All they have are the you know this portrait you know in a studio or or the portrait of their hundredth birthday with front of the cake, but not those photographs. And that's what everybody has told me so far. I said I've never seen. A photograph of my dad or my mom like this and uh, because it captures their true personality it's not them posing yeah which we rarely have when you think of it yeah because i i was thinking about this week it was the idea of all the moments that go unphotographed because we don't think of them as being mm-hmm. worthy of a photograph right especially a family it's those pose, yeah. you know, the pose moments at the celebrations and things like that. But when you remember someone or you remember a moment in your life, there's so many beats that, that stand out. Mm-hmm. And to my mind, those are the moments that you need to photograph because of the, those, those are the things that you remember when you think about a person or you think about a place. And it's interesting yeah. that as photographers, we, we, we sometimes miss that. Absolutely. It's right in front yeah. of us, and yet we don't make the connection. Yeah. And that these, and the, that these images that you're making of these, of these people in an activity, in whether it's in their car or at the the local coffee shop or in their own living room, that really is like, yes, this is the life that they're living, and the image reflects the entirety of it. I think it may be more difficult when it's someone you're close to, though, because I I've tried and I I try more and more now whenever I'm, I'm with my parents um, to photograph moments. But it's harder for them to, um, well, maybe it depends on, on their personality too, but um, it's harder for them to be completely unguarded mm-hmm. yeah. and relax and let, let me, I think women especially, like actually all the centenarians that I photographed that are women, they all had their hair done. And I kind of <laughs> wish they did not because, but you know, that's, that's one of them actually photographed at the salon on her 100th birthday because that's her favorite thing. Every month she gets her hair done. And so I say, hey, could I, could I come and photograph you at the salon? And I did. And I have the series of her getting her hair washed and cut and dried and everything. So that was quite a treat to be able to, to, to be able to do that and have the, the okay from the, from the hairstylist to do that. But, uh, the men are just, um, a lot more themselves and, uh, are a little bit easier. They, I think they, they relax a little bit quicker. The women are always, even at 105, they want to look really pretty. And so you, and they, they tell you, oh, don't photograph, don't photograph that side. Uh, this is my better side. And I still do, you know, I, I, I go around them and I photograph them. But then I'm, I'm, when I show them the pictures before I leave, I usually show them a little bit on the back of the camera and they said, oh no, I don't like that side. So then I make sure when I send them the picture, I don't include that, that photograph because they, you know, they, they think they look better from the others. <laughs> so it's really cute. The Chico Review is a unique six-night retreat exclusively dedicated to the world of photo books. Founded by the Charcoal Book Club, the annual event allows photographers to meet leading editors and book publishers. The event provides valuable networking opportunities, critique sessions, and for one photographer, a prize that includes worldwide publishing of their project through the Charcoal Book Club. Noted speakers and presenters this year will include Sally Mann, Sage Sawyer, Mark Powers, Dana Luxenberg, and Todd Heido. Find out more by visiting ChicoReview.com. And I think it's important when we think of even our moments, not just like the family, about all the Mm -hmm. moments that we, you know, we play through in in all our lives. Um, We just lost our our dog a couple of weeks ago. And, um, and 
what was what was really striking was the absence right mm-hmm. there were so many beats throughout the day like from the moment i stepped out of bed her bed was right next to mine and my feet hit the hardwood floor because i had to remove the bedding and that moment when my feet made contact with the hardwood floor was like really jarring right yeah. and you know or um, how she would bring her leash to me when she was ready to go walking. It, you know, all these things that all of a sudden when it was mm-hmm. gone, it made the loss all the more palpable. But I realized is that those all those little those little moments helped to shape how I remember her. And yeah, I have yeah. pictures of her like laying on the couch or you know things like that. Uh, but those weren't the moments that I was remembering. Yeah, more right. your interaction. My interactions yeah. with her. And I said, wow, it's like, and uh, I don't know how many pictures I have of of that, right? And, but yeah. it gave me it gave me sort of th- 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 that moment. It's like, wow, right? Th- the moments that, the, that are the most special to me, I don't have any pictures of. Yeah. And it made me really sort of think about what I turn the camera on when it comes to my own life. Mm-hmm. Right, and I think that it's 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 I think going to help me as I go forward making photographs not only of my myself and my life but other people's lives those those non moments and yeah. I think it helps in this project for you as a photographer is to be able to allow someone to sort of be themselves to photograph mm-hmm. just such moments because when the family looks at those photographs years from now. They'll see their their parent, their grandparent, um, mm-hmm. in a way that they, in a way that they remember them, not just how exactly. they look. Exactly. Yeah, I mean the way like they lick their finger before they turn the page of the newspaper, and just having captured mm-hmm. that that finger lick in a mm-hmm. photograph and the sequence of turning the page of the paper, they they see that every day, but now they actually have a photograph of it and that's something that don't we don't think of um but you're right we we should be doing that with everyone we love and trying to capture those those moments this um it feels sad it, looking back it, well i i wasn't i mean i did a lot of photography when my children were little but i wish i had done more of that um documentary type of photography with my children as they were little. Whereas at that time I had a portrait studio and I have plenty of them, you know, posing when I was practicing different lighting and everything. And, and I ended up hating having a portrait studio (laughs) and I closed that very quickly, but, um, but capturing more of those everyday moment, you know, their, their little hands holding their first crayon. And, and I hope, you know, maybe this conversation will, will, help people listening, you know, to capture those moments that seem so mundane, yeah. but that's what we do on the streets. That's what we do on the streets. And, exactly. Uh, we need to do it uh, with our own, with our loved ones, um, no matter if they're two-year-olds or hundred-year-old. Yeah, because I, I have found that the, the skill set that I develop on the street has helped me so much when it comes to photography Mm -hmm. that's much more intimate. Because when you're on the street, it's just not this sort of big, big picture. And it's not about just character. Often it's the, the small gesture, the small moments of juxtaposition. And to, to people who are looking at it with the naked eye, they don't see it. But Mm -hmm. when I'm looking at it, at it through the context of the frame, you know, It's, I've eliminated so much so that it's just those small details that make the, the, the moment come to life in a photograph. And having done that for so long, um, when it comes to translating it, like if I'm making a a pictures of a, of a young family interacting with together, I'm processing everything that's happening Mm -hmm. in just the same way as I would on a street corner. Yep. Exactly. And I react to those little moments, I think, because we have a connection, like one picture comes to mind that was last year. And, and it's a, a photograph of a 
young girl with her shoe untied and just the shoe untied. It brought me back to my childhood and I had that instant connection with it. And, and we don't see the girl. We just see the, 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 the skirt and then just the legs. And then the sh really the focus is on the untied shoe, but that's the type of intimate moment that I'm looking for. Um, that just, just the gesture of that tie, un untied shoe, uh, in itself, to me, that was priceless. And, um, it's not about, you know, the, it's not so much about, uh, the, the beautiful light or the beautiful shaft of light or not so much anymore. And, and I think maybe actually working on those project has helped me, um, look for different things on the street or react to different things. So I don't know what, which helped what, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, basically. Yeah. Uh, but these are the, 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 the more intimate moment that I'm looking for. So it's getting closer usually and capturing really that, that, that moment, that gesture, that, but really, um, and, and working, working with difficult light. I love when, and, and I do that with my centenarian. I love when they're, you know, when I'm shooting into the light and, and, uh, and, and they're a little bit silhouetted when I can, or just getting, um, getting right over their shoulder as if I'm seeing through their eyes and things like that, which are things that I love to do on the streets as well. So, um, so I, I really, I really think that, um, doing this project hopefully will make me want to do more f with my own family. Um, if, if they let me, <laughs> <laughs> uh, with children, it's, 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 it's a bit difficult. I mean, they're, they're easy to photograph when they're little and then, then they don't like it anymore. So, uh, so, but now I, even as they're adult, I would love to capture those moments that is so them. Yeah. Um, that I want to, uh, to keep. Yeah. And the same with my parents who are, you know, in their eighties and, and, uh, and that's what I'm trying to do, uh, at, at each visit now is capture those, those moments that even if they're, you know, it's their after lunch nap or things <laughs> like that. They're really, uh, it's, it's their life. Yeah. It's, it's life. Yeah. How do you find your subjects? It can't be, oh. it can't be easy. <laughs> no, so much research, so much research, uh, hours and hours of research for each one. And, uh, so sometimes it's an article that's published in the paper. So-and-so just celebrated their hundredth birthday. So then you reach out to, whoever wrote the article and asked them to connect you with the family members. So sometimes that goes through, sometimes it doesn't. Um, now that the project has gained quite a bit of momentum, um, it's a lot of word of mouth. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's a lot of research. I wish they had a club for centenarians. It would be easier. <laughs> You'd think, I mean, there are over a thousand a hundred year old women in Minnesota and about, about a third of that number in hundred year old men. And so far I have photographed more men than women because they're, um, they, it seems like the men usually they want to talk, they want to share their story. Mm -hmm. So they have never had a no from, uh, uh, a centenarian, a male centenarian would have had more rejections from, from the women. Either they, they're too self-conscious, maybe. I don't know. Um, and they're, the, the men's, uh, more often than not seem to be a lot more upbeat and positive. And I don't know why. Is it because a lot of them, you know, are sharing their, their, their World War II stories and they, they, they want to keep history alive. So they really want to share as, as much as they want it. And they want to talk, talk, talk. Uh, the women, the women tend to be a lot more reserved, uh, in general. So it could be education. Yeah. You know, the women had, pretty tough lives. <laughs> uh, they did a lot of the work. And so you, you hear those stories, you know, their life on the farm. And, um, one I remember said, Oh yeah, for my birthday, my husband bought me a pitchfork. 
<laughs> it's life on the farm, <laughs> raising the kids, milking the cows, and um, and uh, and then the men they tend to want to talk about their their you know quote unquote glory days, you yeah, know, and show pictures and yeah. But I've had two two World War II uh, veteran women as well. Uh, we don't. They never did movies about them or wrote books until now. And yeah. uh, one recently was a code breaker who probably saved thousands of lives because she was um, protect. She was a code breaker for the Navy. Um, so they were very involved and very much a part of of the effort. Uh, but they kind of forgotten. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, when, when it comes to the women, I I, I think it may be a, a generational thing, mm-hmm. which is um, probably goes without saying. But the idea of being, uh, it's not like today where everyone wants to be the center of attention, right? I think yeah. for 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 these for these women, the idea that you are drawing attention to yourself is is vain and not. And not a proper thing to do, right? Probably, yeah. You, yeah, most definitely, yeah. Probably an uh, uh, education or um, just the the time they grew up, they were kind of in, more in the shadows of the of their husband. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, when I yeah. saw that a good number of them were were, were vets, I had I had wondered whether you had uh, leveraged like uh, VAs. So, yes, actually, one contact that was, it was so amazing. One contact who um, saw the project reached out to me and I said, are you still looking for World War II veterans? And I said, well, I'm looking for anyone over the age of 100. In one email, he gave me five. Wow. And and he had contacted them before. And he, he, he gave me all the information as you know, where they served, which, uh, <laughs> under which, um, uh, if they were Navy pilots, I've photographed several pi- World War II pilots. And so, um, so one person connected me to five instantly. And he's actually telling me, and I said, well, I have a couple who are 99, so <laughs> I'll soon be 100. <laughs> Put them on the waiting list. <laughs> yep. So that was really easy because I called and uh, they already knew who I was. So that really made the work easy. And then from there, it kind of exploded. It, it was really quiet. The, after the first two, it was quiet for a month. Every lead I had just just fell through. And it was getting discouraging because uh, the exhibit is already planned for uh, in a gallery in Minneapolis for November and December. So I knew I wanted at least 12 for the exhibit. Mm. And now I'm at 16 and I still have a few months to go. So there will be a book and then an exhibit uh, by the fall. So I'm, now I'm, I'm, my goal is 20. Wow. <laughs> That's a relatively and, and, quick turnaround for a project. Yes, and I'm, I'm hoping to uh, – well, you can't really wait either. When you That's find true. one, you go, you go, and, get, go and photograph them. Um, I photographed one in Normandy on one of my trips in January. I'll be there for a few weeks this summer, so I'm hoping to – to connect with one or two more. Um, I'll be in New York in two weeks. So I'm hoping I can, you know, connect with one and add them to the, to the series. But no, I I don't feel bad that at at first I wanted to carry this project everywhere. I do workshops, but it wasn't realistic. I'm too busy when I'm on workshop. I, usually have one day before the workshop starts and it was that was putting way too much pressure on the projects no it's just going to fall into place it's going to happen when it happens but now knowing that the the first exhibit will be in Minneapolis and many of them will be able to come with their families i'm really happy that yeah. most of them are are locals so um even if they have to drive a, f- a few hours i know many of them will come and so so i'm happy that those families will actually be able to meet. I'm thinking of actually doing a a special like an hour before the opening time for the exhibit just for them so it's a little bit quieter and uh and they have time to really uh um to talk and with each other and meet. So, uh so that will be that will be quite special. Hopefully it won't be a, a snowstorm on that day or something. <laughs> when you think about yourself and you you know you're getting older and making <laughs> 
and really kind of of making decisions in terms of how you spend your time and what's important to you. Yeah. Um, having the chance to sit down with people like this, what kind of insight have you gotten in terms of what you want to prioritize? Oh, it's really learning to enjoy every moment. Um, and that's usually how I try to live my life, uh, not to worry about the past because it's past and not to worry too much about the future because it's not there and all we really have is now. Um, but they're, they're the perfect example of that. They live in the now. And, um, and there's so much to learn and so much to take from that if we could be more in the moment. And really not one thing that I'm trying to do and I think living <laughs> living in the United States has made this even more um, more urgent. Is to to isolate myself and not. I mean, I haven't watched TV in in years. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I caught the news the other day, and it, it was so depressing. I'm like, okay, I can't do this. So, um, live my life. Uh, living my life without, I mean, there's so many things you can't control anyway. So right. why worry about them? And so that has made me want to do that even more, <laughs> honestly. Uh, no. Protecting yourself from the things you can't control anyways, but that are going to just bring you down and, and make you angry and upset for no reason. So... And and it's a difficult thing to do for me, and you know me a little bit. Mm. Uh, I, I tend to be a worrier, and so trying to let go of things I can't control is is not easy. But um, it's a constant, constant battle <laughs> to get there. And so, little by little, it's funny. I had a I had a birthday in March, right? And I thought I was fifty eight until I was filling out some forms. And then it hit, I went, oh my God, I'm 59. And it just, it, it, it was like hit, getting hit with a wet towel, right? And I've never been concerned with the year it was. But for some reason, yeah. m that miscalculation in my mind <laughs> made me go, what, what? what? <laughs> and it was really interesting because I never really thought about like my mortality in that way. Mm -hmm. Right, and all of a sudden, and it's just a number. It is, and it's just a number. Um, you know, I photographed this woman who's 108 who plays the piano every day, and uh, you're thinking, "Wow, <laughs> it's just a number." It's uh, it's all about the attitude. I mean, of course, they 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 have limitations, but <laughs> I had to to laugh the couple of days ago when I met Lois because she said, "Oh, you know, sometimes my shoulders hurt." Like, yeah, well, me too. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> my shoulders hurt a lot, <laughs> and so uh, and she's a hundred and two, and her sh shoulders are starting to give her some trouble. So uh, it made me smile. And, you know, can't really complain because it's only going to get a little worse every day. So. But I think the idea that uh, photographing people doing what they love to do is really important because it's yeah. really about joy. And when you're in yep. joy, you are in the moment. You're not thinking yep. about what's behind you or what's in front of you. Mm -hmm. And there's so many people whose lives lack that. And I think we, exactly. we were lucky in that we share this, you know, this practice of photography, which, you know, obviously gives us both great joy. That's why we mm -hmm. do it. And we do all these things that we've created around it. Because um, for me, it's a, I can't imagine not doing, doing these things. I jokingly tell my wife, you know, when you put me in the box, give me a camera and a microphone just in case. <laughs> She doesn't like I know. that. It, <laughs> we're so we're so lucky to have that. So many people don't have that. Um, it, it and that keeps us in the moment when we're when we have our camera in our hands. So I think that's such a beautiful thing. Such a beautiful thing. We're fortunate. Yeah, um, you've always been working at like multiple projects as long as I've known mm -hmm. you. Um, what else are you working on that you could? can share about oh uh, and they all just 
completely personal project. Every summer now I do a summer vibes, um, to be my third summer where they're just snapshots of everyday life. Um, again, that's like <laughs> mastering the art of the grab shot because it's not taking any time to photograph, but it's photograph that will convey my summer. It's like a diary of my summer, mm -hmm. but without any pressure. One day I will post three pictures and then they won't be any pictures for three days. It doesn't matter. I, I don't like the, the 365 type project. I think there can be very counterproductive. Um, so no pressure. Uh, snapshots. And I love looking back because it brings me back to that moment. It is that emotional metadata and you, you feel the sand, you feel the sun. So it's really a diary of my summer. Yeah. So I do that for three months every year now. I've done uh, winter projects quite a bit. Um, I'm also, sometimes the project is there. You just don't realize it. Like I, I traveled to Mexico and Spain recently and I was drawn to children playing soccer, football. Um, and, and I, I look back and I have so many photographs of children kicking the ball on the streets, you know, uh, using, cans as uh to make the 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 goal post or shoes or and so and then I started looking back and it just became a series because I realized that if there is one game in the world that brings people together regardless of race religion um it is is football soccer and it, to me it's the it's it's often referred to as as the beautiful game and that's actually how I started the series the beautiful game so now mm. whenever i'm 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 out and about i'm looking for moments of kids just kicking the ball on the street not something you find in the united states very often no. um it's more the basketball you know and and but uh, when you're in in um in europe or in in mexico um it, those are moments that you see all the time so i like having those projects because um it keeps you entertained or it keeps you looking for that nugget, that treasure, uh, when you're out and about with your camera. And so it's, so I think it's important to have several projects. Then never, I mean, not all my projects are, are as time consuming <laughs> as one century. Um, I think. That will probably go on for a few years. I think this year I'm really, really looking for them. Once the book is out and I've had an exhibit or two, I think they will come to me. Yeah. And um, so, but I will continue to document those amazing people because I really feel that they're they're often forgotten. You know, they're many of them actually, most of them still live in their own homes. Surprisingly, I thought they would all be in in uh, in retirement homes, but they're not. And but even when they're in their own homes, I think they're often forgotten. And uh, so, um, documenting their daily lives to me is quite quite a joy. And uh, yeah, it, it it makes me happy. It's really about doing what makes me happy. I'm, I'm too old now to do anything that, that I don't want to do. <laughs> That's great. Well, my last question yeah. that I ask each guest is I ask them to recommend uh, a photographer for our listeners to discover and explore. And it can be anyone, someone you've long admired and or someone you've recently discovered. So who would that one photographer be and why? So for me, it will tie into what we discussed is my friend Susan Rosenberg Jones in New York City, who you may have had on the show. She's documented those moments of mm -hmm. everyday life, uh, in, in our own homes with her husband, Joel, whom I've met and we had lunch together, uh, just a wonderful co couple. And, um, she is a master of capturing the, the, the moment, uh, the moments of daily life. And so I, I would urge everyone to, to check her out and, um, and check out her series. Really touching, touching, uh, stories. She's done several projects since then, but the one where she just photographs moments of in, in, um, in, in her, in her apartment in New York of, of, her husband Joel have just been so touching and so so beautiful. It's all color, yeah, color pho uh, photography. Uh, really, really special and very funny. 
Yes. Oh, there's so much humor. <laughs> but then you know, I I know both of them now, and uh, and uh, their their sense of humor and a husband's sense of humor is, is so special that uh, I can see that it just fits. It all fits. So yeah, that's I urge a, people to go check out her work. That's a great recommendation, especially considering everything we've been talking about for the last hour. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Well, Valerie, thank you again. Thank you so much. Thanks to Valerie for joining us. You can learn more about Valerie and her work by visiting ValerieJardinPhotography.com. And if you're a fan of our work, you can write reviews on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts and share a favorite episode on social networks, be it X, formerly Twitter, Facebook, or Instagram. Remember to use the hashtag, The Candid Frame. You can support us financially via Patreon, and if you want to make a one-time donation to the show, you can do so by visiting buymeacoffee.com forward slash The Candid Frame. Thanks to Patricia Clicks, Brian J. Lewis, Les Zackler, C. Dwayne Pearson, and Peter Joseph for their recent contributions. We've relaunched our newsletter using Substack. Sign up today and receive regular updates on all things related to TCF. And if you can't find every episode of the show on whatever service you use to listen to podcasts on, download the Canon Frame app, available for Apple iOS and Android. And because of your generosity, it's free to download and use. No additional purchases are required. The Candid Frame's audio engineer is Martin Taylor, who you can find at the other martintaylor.com. The show's senior producer is Cynthia Parker. And this is Ibarian X, and this is The Candid Frame.